Um, hello, everybody. First of all, I'd like to know um, CF Summit Europe. Anyone who attended the previous uh, summit in Basel last year? Oh, great. So, some new faces, some old. Welcome back for the old ones. Welcome, anyways, for the new ones. Today, I'd like to continue our story on our cloud native journey at Rijkswaterstraat. First, uh, Rijkswaterstaat in a nutshell. Basically, we're an executive organization of the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. <coughs> we basically maintain and develop the national roads, the waterways and open waters, and will be supporting a sustainable environment. Basically, keep everybody mobile and keep the feet dry. Around 8,800 employees, by now probably around 9,000. Once upon a time, Cloud Foundry. We started our journey end of 2015. I still remember Pivotal came in on Tuesday and we had the platform up and running on Wednesday and the first app pushed within a week after that operational. That was a pretty cool experience to, to be part of it, part of. By 2017, our platform was uh, getting very successful and uh, we could no longer operate it as a proof of concept. We really had to take it into production levels, which also meant many service upgrades after office hours. In 2018, we focused a lot on automation of platform management. I mean, everything you have to need to do twice and is uh, easily automatable. We automate it basically. If you want to know about automation, and we did all of that, uh, you can check out my previous talk I held at CF Summit Basel last year. By 18, uh, 2018, we uh, finally managed to convince the business that it's okay to upgrade the platform, even during office hours. I mean, the platform is highly available, applications got running. I still remember the one time when I and my manager were having lunch one of our customers was walking by. Hey, you guys were doing the platform upgrade, right? Yes, we are. We'll get the Slack message when it's done. Okay. So we automated our patching and minor upgrades. And by May, we had basically everything automated. We, we wanted to automate at the time. So we had our reporting and monitoring in place. And uh, yeah. In September, uh, we started uh, building uh, our Cloud Foundry in second data center using NSXT for us, uh, new technology, for basically having a failover option for our mission critical systems. The main one being the National Water Monitoring Network, but there are also others. In June, we introduced Container as a Service, uh, CFCR, uh, based on Kubernetes. And our goal is to have uh, CFAR, CFCR combined, one platform to rule them all in 2020. I'd like to give a big shout out here at uh, our partners at GrapeUp who got uh, the, the container as a service uh, stuff uh, sped up in like no time. I think that for them it was a f at first as well. VMware, vSphere, NSXT. But they pulled it off. It was uh, very impressive. Uh, great engineering. Well done. Typical use cases for Kubernetes. Uh, in our case, uh, we are using uh, in our uh, platforms, we use uh, components like MuleSoft, ESB, so the SAS BI suite, GIS component, GitLab, and those are typical off the shelf container deployments we can put on Kubernetes. Also, we had applications which cannot really be made cloud friendly. Uh, Cloud friendly. Uh, one, uh, one case was our instruments application which calculating model models. We had a discussion with them and those models ran for days. And with our upgrade pattern of doing several patches a week, the process were not interruptible, so we decided now better not put it on Cloud Foundry. And also, it's a great landing place for le legacy, uh, uh, sorry, uh, heritage applications. A little bit about uh, the National Water Monitoring Network. We have around 450 sensor locations in the Netherlands, but also nearby. Taking measurements of water quantity, uh, flows of water, for example, water quality, salt levels, uh, and stuff like that. 
weather information, wind speed, etc. And the state of objects, whether gates are open or closed, the state of the, the engines operating the gates. All input for our network. What we do with it, we can do smart model, man smart water, smart water management using enduring droughts and high water. Input for shipping reporting. We can inform everyone who is on our waterways what's the state of everything. And last but not least, it's input for our flood defense. Most of the Netherlands, uh, up to I think around Utrecht, I mean like halfway the chart would be underwater if uh, things would go horribly wrong. So we took some measures in protecting ourselves. Uh, the National Water Monitoring Network in a nutshell, I mean the actual topology is a lot more complex than this, but basically we have sensors, we have IoT gateways, and then we have uh, centralized processing our data centers. We've got applications running on Cloud Foundry, we have the SOS BI suite, and we have the new uh, ESB for uh, messaging. Okay, so when we uh, heard we're going to uh, onboard this onto Cloud Foundry, uh, yes, well, they have everything redundant, but we didn't. We have only one site. So, site redundancy was an absolute must. What did we have? We had uh, in our one, one data center, we had uh, one test site and one uh, yeah, site which was basically running applications for, for development, tests, acceptance and production, all in one big Cloud Foundry setup. That's something we never quite liked. I mean, test applications should not impact production. So we, yeah, we wanted to make a split there. Another problem we faced is that our test site, the second one, was actually for us to test new stuff, uh, play around with different setups. But it was also part of our chain to upgrade the platform. You don't want to push an upgrade into production before you validate it in another environment. So. That second environment was uh, dual world and it, it limited our ability to yeah, make changes. So we started building our second site. Uh, we put in a production uh, environment, so uh, only production applications will run on this platform. Of course, our developers still want to be able to test uh, things, so we also built a second uh, foundation which will run everything else. And um, at some point we would tell our developers, okay, it's all ready, we have got it all set up, you can migrate your apps. Of course we will help them, we are very helpful guys. We, we try to make life as easy as possible for our friends in the developer side. Sometimes they do need some help. Of course, we uh, also have Kubernetes because part of the water management chain is also components like SAS BI and ESB, and Kubernetes is a perfect place to put them there. And we also have a massive parallel processing database, uh, also provided by Pivotal Greenplum. The test environment. Well, we could put it all on the same vSphere and the 6T environment, but we also want to be able to validate updates on the EAS level. So we wanted to have a separate environment for that. So there we can finally make the split between testing new releases and our own plaything, our own playground for testing whatever else we wanted to test. And of course, for Kubernetes and Greenplan, we also need a test environment. Then, once everything, everyone was migrated, well, we would love to use the re recycle the, the pre-existing infrastructure, but it's by now it was dated, it was no longer sustainable, so we have to uh, do platform on that hardware lifecycle management. So we'll break it down and put down a new environment with new hardware. And we are only going to do production there because when you look at it, only production really needs to be high available. And that's only for mission critical applications. So everybody else will land in production and unless you make a request to be, or if you're marked as mission critical, you can also run on the second production site. The same applies for Kubernetes, of course, and uh, Greenplum. 
and between the green plant main science we use Gemfire to uh, replicate changes, so everything will be up to sync. Of course, we also need a site load manager, so traffic can be directed to either site. Actually, one of the requirements our, uh, our friends uh, for the LMB project, the water management project, was they explicitly want to be like an active standby setup, so they will run on the main site, and each season they will switch their processing to the other side, so both sides will be used actually. Access for the platform. Well, at Rijkswaterstaat, our uh, workplace environment doesn't allow to install any software yourself. So if you want to push an application into your environment, if you want to set pipelines, you need tooling for that, and that tooling has to run somewhere. If it can't be on your desktop, well, we decided to help out our uh, developers and give them a jump box. Originally, we had one Linux system on which people control tooling, but then if people started downloading database backups and never cleaned up after themselves, we went in this space, so we thought maybe we better give each tenant, each organization, uh, unit within Cloud Foundry their own jump box. If they make life hard, they only make it hard, life hard for their own teams and not for anybody else. And all these job box boxes, what we need to put there? Well, when you look at it, we need tooling. We need Bosch. We love Bosch. It's a great tool. We need access to our uh, S3 compatible storage. We use Minio clusters for, to store, for example, our backups. But also, we did a migration from the, what, called, what was it called, the WebDev, the, 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 the standard blob store, because that's one single point of failure we wanted to get rid of. So we decided, okay, we use uh, external blob storage and we put it on a Minio cluster and then we are high available on that level as well. We, of course, we also need the Ops Manager CLI. And Terraform, a recent addition, uh, when we started working with Kubernetes, we also needed Terraform to manage the, the network part. DevOps tools, I would call them the category either, uh, well, everybody is using basically. Of course, the famous uh, CF CLI for your CF push experience. We also need a Fly CLI for uh, anything related to a concourse, for pushing your pipelines, managing them there. We also need GradHub to get access to your credential management store, so we can store the credentials there. And there's tools like Git, Curl, JSON Query, YAML Query, and others. And a new addition with the introduction of Kubernetes, uh, KubeCuttle, Helm, and Docker. I don't know if I forgot any. I think those are the main ones. Oh, quite a little tuning, but uh, yeah, we have pipelines, we do automation, so we can also keep our jump boxes up to date. Platform practices. That, that's uh, uh, the feedback we got from uh, our, our uh, recent visit at uh, Philadelphia, the previous summit. There was a lot of people uh, on, on, on how you can make your production environment more and more stable. I mean, when we look at our own environment, we had a lot of custom build packs, even some people using Docker images to run their apps. We do not want, really want to allow that, so we decided, okay, in our new production environment, we're not going to do that unless you have an per explicit permission and support arranged for custom build packs. Another thing, build pack upgrades. I still remember, I don't know, like half a year ago, there was a new PHP build pack coming out with some security fixes. So ideally, all PHP applications would need to be restaged so you can take care of the fixes in the new build pack. But we didn't have a policy to enforce that. By now, we're definitely going to enforce it. Application management. Applications in product, production must be managed by application engineers. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, we had in the early days, especially push to production. Okay, we have got a team who is building great software, put it on the platform, put it into production, and then the team went off to other things. Most of our developers are external to the company, so they hired in to run a project, build the software, and then they're gone. Uh, wait, uh, who's going to manage the application once it's put into production? Anyone? Uh, okay, so now we made a statement. No apps going to production unless you have engineers. It's really not difficult 
to manage an, an application running on Cloud Foundry, we noticed it's, it's generally, it's not like a, how you call that, a top technical application management role is more like that light. I mean, there's not really a lot you need to do. You don't need to worry about managing your middleware stack, calling people, hey, I need more and more memory into it. Uh, I, need, I need to put more and more VMs. The platform does a lot to help you out. Centralized logging, we've got centralized logging, we've got monitoring, so application management is really not that hard. Source code, of course, should be put in Git. Either the internal GitLab, we have uh, on-premise GitLab running, or a public GitHub, but now private repos, not repos we can't access. Configuration, the famous manifest files, should also be in Git. Well, when you combine these two, well, you can build your application pipeline because you've got all the stuff you need. And you can automate your development, test, acceptance, production, uh, lifecycle management. Great tool, Concourse. I love it. One of the things we run, for example, on Concourse is our smoke test. Basically, every five minutes we push an app, check, and the app will check itself. Uh, like, okay, I'm running, okay. Can I talk to all my services I'm using here? And, and, and then it will send the updates to the GUI. We have running on our big screen in our ops environment. And then we can see if anything goes wrong. In this example, our, our test, uh, test cluster failed. Boy, did, are we happy we split our test and production clusters. So production was not affected. Now, I mentioned two sides. Of course, we need some kind of upgrade policy. How are we going to upgrade this environment? I'm going to focus here only on the Cloud Foundry part. Well, we don't want to start out with uh, putting updates into production, so we start out with our release uh, environment. Well, this is a little magic arrow which says, okay, we get our software from somewhere and put it on the release uh, environment. In our original pipelines, we got uh, the, 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 the packages directly from PIVNET. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe that's not such a good idea. We have already had, I think at least twice, twice the case that an update pulled in from PIVNET, we deployed it, and it crashed our environment. Oh, it was automated, it was running in the night time. Next morning we came back. Oh, why it failed? Check out PIVNET. Oh, the, the, the deployment we just downloaded is already removed because there was a bug in it. Oh, great, thank you very much. Um, hmm. So, probably we are going to download it first into a local repository, maybe put in a small delay. I mean, stem cells, we don't want to delay, vulnerability CVA should be fixed, but maybe like product updates, maybe we can wait a day or so, and then if it's withdrawn, then we don't need to upgrade. Also, we're using images in Docker Hub. So, well, unless Docker Hub gets, gets hacked, of course, it's no problem, right? So, oh shit, that has been done already, I believe. Okay, so, uh, well, we've got Kubernetes running, we've got Harbor running also, so let's put our images uh, we need in, har in, in Harbor, and then we don't need to worry about Docker Hub crashing or burning. Well, anyways, moving on from our release test environment, uh, we will push the upgrades both to production and non-production. Well, okay, for our customers it's production and non-production. We consider both of them to be equally important. Both of them are production, so we want to upgrade them at the same time. Normally, after that, when both of them succeed, we, we would push it into our second production. No. We did have uh, occasions where we successfully upgraded the platform and then developers started calling us after a day or so, like, hey, my application stopped working because some interoperability comp uh, problems with, with UA or something like that. That's not something you can validate. So just to make sure that we always have a platform available for the people who really need it, we decided to introduce a delay of, let's say, a week. So then they have a week time to find out any problems with the application. And then only after that, we will push it into the second production site. We use PCF pipelines. Uh, 
cool tooling to, to automate your, your platform upgrades. <coughs> Uh, but we did have separate pipelines. To, we split, uh, split the functionality, basically. We have a separate pipeline. Uh, here we have an example of, well, I guess that's maybe the most complex one, when you look, just look at the number of little blocks you see there. Uh, upgrading the build packs. Each build pack has its own mini pipeline running in there. We also had a pipeline for upgrading the operations manager, the POS style, basically the CFAR functionality, all the server styles and the infamous BBR, the Bosch Backup and Restore, to make backups of uh, the platform. And of course we needed the apply updates as well. So only after the BBR would succeed, we would start trigger the backup, uh, trigger the update. It would first uh, update our test site, then it would run our smoke test just to make sure everything is going well. Here the upgrade succeeded, but the test failed. So then we can figure out what went wrong before we push it into production. Here's an example of how we would upgrade Bosch deployments. You have a lot of inputs there. We would first go, same procedure actually, first go to our pre-acceptance environment, then push acceptance and production, and only after that we go to the second production site. Lessons learned. Well, first, I guess the biggest one, proactive monitoring is key here. We are the first to spot the problems, even in services we do not provide ourselves. Things like DNS or ADFS for single sign-on integration or our SharePoint or at some point in time we always ended up running into problems with systems and then but our customers are not going to complain about hey uh, DNS is failing or ADFS is failing whatever they say hey the platform doesn't work my app I can't reach my app the perception for the end user is like the platform is not working. And we want to know up front if something goes wrong. Okay, we can isolate it. The smoke test screen you saw earlier with all the components, if the database is failing, we can see, oh, the database is failing and we can act on that. Often before the owners of the actual services know it's wrong, we know first, generally. And we have to call them, hey, your ADFS is not working. Oh. We push the app every five minutes, the smoke test which validates DNS and whether we can really push an app and the app itself will validate its attached services. Some things we did not anticipate, things we did not expect to happen or we hadn't considered when it came, acro uh, came across. A major one, we ran into NSXT. Anyone using NSXT here? It, we, we realized after we started installing stuff, uh, it gave us less flexibility in the platform sizing. When you, when you set up your Cloud Foundry environment in SXT, the first time we did a proof of concept, uh, one of our engineers, our friends at ITQ, uh, Ruud, uh, installed it uh, on this test environment. Okay, put in the container network and then we put it there and it was all fine and running and I saw it and I thought, ah, wait, can we add a second org to that? No, it couldn't because the single IP container IP space was given to that system org. You have to say, okay, each organization needs to get a slash 24 network. Uh, yeah, okay, so some of them will be really small, some of them will be really be big. We can't, yeah, okay, so that's something you need to consider. Go build packs uh, bro broke our smoke test uh, Go app. New version, uh, a new build pack came out and the Go version we were using was too old, no longer supported, so our smoke test stopped working. Maybe we need a smoke test for build pack uh, operations as well, upgrades as well. Pushing the same app, the smoke test app, we never deleted it, we only pushed it to make sure push is working. After a few days our build pack cache filled up. Oh, that we didn't expect. Well, we can clear the build pack cache. We did it with a pipeline, but that's a kind of workaround. And also a funny one, when a new version of the Nginx build pack came out, our build pack pipeline running uh, for example for updating Go build pack thought, oh, a new update for my Go build pack, let's, let's download and install it. Go asterisk. It's not, a, it's not a wildcard pattern as you use in Linux environments for, for, for file matching. No, it's a regular expression. So go asterisk, ma matches a G, capital G, and any number of O's trailing it, including zero. 
So Nginx matched perfectly. So we got Nginx running and our Go application started. No, it doesn't work. So we read the fucking read the manual. We went to <laughs> we went to <laughs> we went to the to the documentation on concourse on how to use the PivNet resource and oh my god, our exact scenario was an example of what you should not do. <laughs> Epic fail there. Well, <laughs> I could go on for hours, but any questions? No questions? No questions. Ah, here's one. Uh, so you had two production uh, Cloud Foundry f uh, foundations. Yes. Um, are apps running either on one of them, or can they also run on both and being load balanced? Um, it is possible. Uh, at current, we don't have applications which are running on both sides, um, but we won't limit them. I mean, the GLSLB running in, f in front would allow traffic to load balance, but then you have to worry about how do you handle your application state. That yeah. also needs to be. Uh, that's not in our scope, so... So what, what's the use of the load balancer in front of it then? Basically to direct traffic to one side or the other. I mean, normally all traffic okay. would go to one side, but as I mentioned earlier, the water management people really want to be able to switch. They actively want to be a able to use our each side so they can be sure both sides are still functional and they're always able, in case of disaster, to be able to use the other one. Hmm. That gives them also the, the, the confidence that both sides are still okay. okay. And um, so your apps are, or some of your apps are stateful? Well, actually most of them are, but most of them are linked to like a database, so that, that makes them stateful. <laughs> I mean, the, I, plot, I mean, it, uh, building a, 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 let's say, a cloud native app itself is not really hard, as long as you don't have to worry about state, but People need to log in. We have all, uh, single sign-on. That already means you have to worry about session management, uh, who is logged in, and if you have multiple instances running, you have to worry about how your flows go from your uh, browser to your application. So already you need some session management, which is external to the container, something like Redis, for example. Yeah, so uh, most of them are stateful, yes. Just one small question. Wait a second. <laughs> it's my spot for today. Um, you said you're limited with NSXT when sizing your organizations. Um, when you can't pre-plan how organizations are growing, how do you manage that? Well, currently, currently we we made the arbit where we looked at the current sizes of our organization, how fast they were growing. I mean, when I look at the, the numbers, like when I did my presentation one year ago, we had like around 400 applications running. Now it's near to 600, but the, the progression seems to be still kind of linear. But when you look at indiv individual organizations, yeah, we decided the slash 24, so 200, 253 applications well, seem to be a safe limit, and it's always possible to add another org with maybe another name on it. But yeah, it, it, it's a hard decision to make. Because, yeah, you're wasting space, basically, IP space. That's why we don't like that limitation, actually. <laughs> okay, no further questions? Oh, well, thank you all for joining my presentation. Well, actually, the timing for the summit is perfect. If anyone is still around in the Netherlands this coming Saturday, we have our annual test closure. You see those big things on the screen. Like, I th believe each one of them is like 200 meters long. Uh, one of the biggest movable structures in the world. Part of our flood defenses. We test them every year. This coming Saturday, we will close them around 3 o'clock. So if you want to see it live, you can go there. You can even get a guided tour. Great stuff. Cool. Thank you all. <laughs>